lot of my research going back over a decade and a half, we were tracking where AI would have an inflection and would become extremely common, would become a major force in the workforce. And like all those inflection points, they tend to be, oh my God, this is new. We never saw this coming. But actually, this was totally predictable. Um, I'd also worked with an AI with one of my colleagues, ex-colleagues who does run an AI um, company. So I've got a lot of experience in computational linguistics. But anyway, that's the background. That's the history. So let's talk about what we've actually done. I'm just going to uh, move to the next slide. So um, by the end of the session, what I'd like to do is give you some very practical patterns about how you can code uh, within Deluge uh, to automate a whole bunch of things using OpenAI. Uh, we're using it for streamlining our marketing operations, and we've got more to do in that space, but oh my God, it's probably saving us probably a day a month in terms of, of manpower, but more importantly, it's improving the quality and the consistency. Uh, case management. Um, when inquiries, we call cases inquiries, when they come in, we have to make sure that they're really, really high quality. And unfortunately, a lot of the time when inquiries are sent to us, the language is all over the place. I mean, things are, are messy and we can use chat GPT to actually clean up what our clients are asking. Uh, we also use it for tagging information. It's we monitor everything about our clients, what they're looking on the website, what cases they're asking, uh, what they're reading, uh, what emails they're opening. And we have a set of uh, tags that we use to tie all of that information together. And OpenAI helps us really bring that to life. Um, we do that because we like to know where our research should head. So if suddenly everyone starts looking at, well, zero trust, identity and access management uh, and governance services in relation to Microsoft Purview, we can see it coming <laughs> and then we can get ahead of it. So that whole case management with AI is really useful. Um, an interesting little experiment I did, I haven't turned it on, is taking customer testimonials and bringing them out to be more of a case study. And that's actually very effective, but we haven't turned it on uh, for a couple of reasons I'll talk about soon. Uh, and quality control over addresses. This is a really interesting one. All of you who have got uh, sales forces know that salespeople are not particularly tidy when it comes to entering addresses in, but open AIs, uh, generative text can actually look at bad address data and break it up and expand it and correct it, uh, usually pretty accurately into fields. And that's something which I, I don't see a lot of people working on. So there's a lot of use cases that we're using it for. Use cases for AI. I think it's really important to use AI as an assistant and not a replacement for staff. And the reason for that is, particularly with uh, the open AI that most of us will be using for um, uh, the inclusion for, uh, inside the CRM will be Turbo 3.5. And that's a great, fast, and, and pretty damn good um, text completion algorithm. So you give it a prompt and it sends you some information back. But it lacks the voice and the understanding of your business. So you can use AI to assist a human operator, but make sure that in every instance before anything goes out to the client, that there's this air gapping, that you've got a real brain looking over it. Um, I would say, uh, you know, the productivity benefits that we're getting from including generative AI inside the CRM processes is, is just the tip of the iceberg of where we're going to head. But at every step of the way, we don't trust AI. And I think we have to come to that uh, realization. So do use it for all the things I just talked about in the previous slide. Do not use it to write emails or chat and send them automatically. You can use it. For, we have tested it on Sales IQ. And you get away with it, but honestly, it's not that useful. Um, people don't want to have a conversation with a chatbot. This is what we've found, at least for our side. They just want to get a fast way to a service, fill in the details, and get a response quickly. Um, we have used, however, on our website, we haven't turned it on, but we've actually taken 20 years worth of our research material. It's all advice on how to run IT projects and how to run IT staff and all of that. And we've compiled that into what's called a vector database and used that with OpenAI to have 
Initially, we thought, was this an experiment to replace us advisors? You know, when the inquiries come in, we can just be replaced with a robot that can go through all of our research. The answer to that is, yeah, not really. And the reason for that is we listen to what the clients are actually doing. But wow, it makes a powerful search tool for the website. So again, it comes back to this idea of you really need a human in the environment. So what do you need to start? If you're going to do this, you need, there's a typo there. Um, you need, there's two typos on that one line. Uh, by the way, I am dyslexic. I apologize for typos. Um, uh, so you'll need an open AI account. Uh, my strong suggestion is go straight with a paid account for this um, because you will definitely want to be buying the API. You want to be testing quite a lot, the prompts, and you'll be wanting access to the paid um, uh API account, so get that. What you'll then do is go into Open API, generate what's called an API key. My suggestion is create one key for the CRM work, one key for Zoho Flow if you're going to put it in there. And basically, every one of our services, I generate a separate key for every, for every Zoho service. Um, I had considered getting more granular and saying, okay, the marketing services will have one key and so forth. The reason I would think of doing that is so that I could see how often we are using different API keys for different services within Zoho and how much that's costing us. So I could say all of the automation we're doing in marketing is costing us a you know, dollar a month. And seriously, these are really low costs uh, for, for an organization of, our, of that size. Or you know, should we be breaking that out to um, the sales support cost and so forth? At the end of the day, I just realized, yeah, the cost is so low, it doesn't matter. So, but I do break it down by product because I want to detect if maybe one of our products, Soho products, gets breached, God forbid, hasn't happened, don't expect it to happen. But if we see suddenly a whole bunch of API calls going up unexpectedly, we'll know that we've got some sort of a security issue, hence uh, breaking up the API keys. Um, you do need to have a knowledge of the open APIs, so read the documentation. Um, decide on which model you want to use. Turbo 3.5 is what I use. It's fast, it's cheap, and it's good enough for most of what you want. You can go to the GPT-4 model. It's expensive. It sometimes times out. And it does give better results for some things, but not significantly enough to override that cost issue. And it's... So those are the things you need to start. So... I wanted to first of all start with a pattern since this is going to be a very practical session. Um, when I started trying to figure out what is a good pattern uh, and where was I going to put the deluge functions, was I going, you know, the decision was I could put them in Catalyst, I could put them in the CRM, I could put them all embedded inside Zoho Flow. And what became very apparent is the majority of the calls that we were going to be making were actually CRM functions or CRM activities calling Deluge functions that would then call OpenAI. And that said, okay, I should probably use the CRM effectively as my serverless backplane. So within uh, the CRM, we now have all the functions, we now have lists and lists and lists of functions that are designed to be called both within the CRM, but also from other external sources, mostly from other Zoho products, particularly Zoho Flow um, and uh, potentially Zoho Campaign, uh, sorry, Zoho Creator. But the overall function is, let's start at the core. Um, I tend to say that the, the, um, the CRM button is one of the core pieces. Now you can use a standalone primary logic as a standalone, and then have a button call. You might have an API that's going to run ChatGPT that starts with something called, let's say, um, uh, describe this tag, for example, which is what we're going to be using here. So you've got a standalone REST API. Then you can create a CRM button, and all that that button does is call that standalone activity. So even though that's two API calls, it's nesting it down. That means that you can also create a multi-button logic, uh, sorry, multi-select button logic that still runs off the same code and a CRM workflow, uh, an automation that runs off the same code. You always call the base standalone item. 
That means that if you have an error or if you need to change your key or if OpenAI changes things, their GPT-5 comes out, you want to try using that, you only change it one place and all of the other calls that you've got with will pipe down to that call and therefore will be, uh, the changes will reflect it throughout. So that's an encapsulation approach. Within the primary REST API, the standalone REST API that you're going to be creating, the steps that you need to do is fetch whatever item it is from the CRM by the ID. Now, the reason why you unfortunately have to always fetch it by the ID, well, not always, almost always, is because you can't pass very long pieces of text um, as a parameter with uh, some of the API calls. So by fetching ID, you can pretty much send one little piece of code and you get all of the record. You can access pretty much anything in the system. Uh, also, you can then fetch um, uh, any additional information that you might need. So you might need to say, if you've got an inquiry, you might need to call uh, the user who is the owner of that inquiry and the related to contact record and bring all of that together because you might need to combine all of this information and send it on to the uh, GPT. The next piece that I'm going to recommend that you do is use CRM, uh, use the CRM variables to fetch the prompt that you're going to use. Do not embed the prompt of your GPT um, API call within the log within the hard code of the API. And the reason I'm suggesting that uh, as much as possible is it means that you can make it available to your users or to selected users so that they can modify the prompt without having to call a poor IT department, which is in this case, just me every single time. Um, if you need to fetch external data, again, you embed that within uh, the primary logic. And we do have cases where we're fetching external data, say from our word, that information in as well. Only once you've played it all of that, do you then send the API call out to open API, you process the results. Now that's really interesting because a lot of people think that the returning information from open AI is just a piece of text. If you tell it to, you can tell OpenAI to format your data as a set of fields. Um, and that's how we do the address functions. So, but once they come back, you then have to split them up and make sure that they're correct. Um, finally, I'm a big, big, big believer that every single API you call should have, um, should be returning uh, the full results of whatever it is plus your, your, your status messages, your error messages. So use those tricycles. Now, before we go on, this was the highest level. I'm, I'm gonna get more practical now. So let's go through the nine steps that I'm using, the nine generic steps in this pattern. So the first one is you need to define your, AP, your API keys as variables. Um, that should be common knowledge to most of the people here. Please um, do not hard code them. By the way, Zoho, I would love you to create an admin only set of variables, a CRM variables, where we can put the API keys and tuck them away so that if we need to modify them across the entire environment, we can do it with one call. Nice. But look, what you do is you take your open AI key and you, I, I literally set the variable open API key. And if I'm going to be uh, calling uh, OpenAI, I also, even though it's always the same, I also set it as a variable. And that's more just a, a force of habit because it means that then I can cut and paste chunks of the code, the, the functional code between different functions, just saves time. So that's very useful. Next, fetch the CRM record. Now, the, the ability to, um, the reason why I, I do recommend not trying to pass all of the information that you want in the actual call of the API. So you might have a record and you want to send the contact name, the contact ID, their ad address, what, what email or whatever. Now, things that you're wanting, God knows, don't, don't send that to ChatGPT, but you get the idea. You're going to have a whole slew of these um, uh, fields to pass on the API call within CRM. My suggestion is just send the record IDs that you want. 
And even though it's an additional call within the API, use Zoho to get the record. What that means is you get every single piece of information that you're actually going to need. And you also get access to the, uh, uh, the very long fields of data, which really you're going to be processing a lot with ChatGPT. Just makes things a heck of a lot easier. So please do that. It's especially useful when, you, when you're um, approaching things with buttons. Um, so there's the code for it. Uh, we all know that code. It's pretty simple. You basically just do a Zoho CRM get records by ID, give it the name of the, the um, um, module that you're using. In this case, the, the actual use case I'm talking about here is we have what we call tags. Now, these are not the same things as the tags in the CRM. These are IBRS tags. Remember I told you about how everything we do has been tagged with a, a let's call it a topic. And that topic means if we're seeing one of our clients reading stuff on the website with that topic, um, asking inquiries with that topic, um, uh, coming to web events with that topic, we can join all of those, uh, sending emails with that topic, we can join all of these things together and see patterns. So we actually have a module that defines what those tags, topics are, and we use them in everything. What we didn't do previously is we didn't write what those topics tags actually meant. We never publicly exposed them. They're always internal. What this little system does is it takes that tag and it might be something like CRM or it might be something along the lines of ITSM. Um, and then it expands them, it uses ChatGPT to give a description of them. But not only that, it also then creates another call to GPT and finds 10 SEO questions that are commonly asked about that topic. And we use that for training purposes internally. So really, really funky thing. So what we're doing here is we're basically getting the tag, fetching the information of the tag. We now have it. And um, we go and grab the tag name. Next thing is we fetch the Zoho CRM variable. So what we do here is we simply get that CRM variable, in this case, GPT generated tag prompt. And I will show you what that looks like right now. Um, I think it's this one. Yep, there you go. So, oh, actually, this is not, not the tag prompt, but it's a similar thing, so <laughs> basically the same thing. Uh, what you can see here is it's a multi-line variable, and it says, in this case, write a 50 to 150 word question with the following inquiry. The original inquiry question text is, and you see here, I've got the description. That field, that's actually the same name as the field in our case management system, inquiry system. So whatever the description of the case was, it gets inserted in here. The subject of the inquiry is subject. So again, that's going to be replaced. And the response that we have already given is response. So it, those three little pieces in square brackets are going to get replaced by um, the incoming information from the record in the previous step where we were clicking the record information. So step two. Let's just go and play that a bit more again. Excellent. All that we're doing is we're running a replace on any fields with data from the CRM. So you do that by going the G, the, the prompt that we've just taken from the CRM. Uh, we're replacing all of the tag names. So in this case, it would be the tag name from the previous action with the tag name that we pulled out of the system. So that could be, if it was a different type of call, the example that I showed you before, it could be description is description. And you just do that for all the fields that you're going to replace. So I hope that makes sense. So basically you now have a completed prompt. Then you set up the open API header, and this is identical pretty much for every single one you do. So you just create a header map, you make the content type, it's all standard, and you make the open API uh, bearer plus, and that's where you put your open API, your open AI key. That's where you stick that in. Doesn't change. Every single time you call, that's the header you're going to use. Okay, now. Now comes the tricky part. This is where it actually took me almost an hour to actually figure out what I was doing wrong with this initially. 
um, and it just required a little bit of fiddling around. You need to set up what's called a message list for OpenAI. And the message list should, cons could, should consist of some roles, uh, a system role and a user role. And the system role, which you can see here in this area here, that is actually more important than you think. Oop, I've gone. There we go. That's actually more important than, than you realize because the system role describes to OpenAI what it is you're trying to achieve at the highest level. And so in this particular case, we are defining those tags, those topics. So what we discovered is that the word dictionary really worked well here. So the system role of this is OpenAI, we're treating you like a dictionary. And then you need to give it um, one or more user prompts. Now, think of it this way. If you were in the, in the uh, chat GPT and you were typing stuff in, asking it to do things, that's what this prompt is. So the role is a user and the content is that prompt that we created by merging the CRM um, uh, variable. So we had our prompt there and taking all of the field data and inserting it in the appropriate place into that prompt using just the Zoho replace command. And we're sending that. If you've got a very long prompt um, or a complex discussion that you're going to want, you can actually add multiple lists, message lists to this. So you can have more than one of these. That's very useful when you're dealing with things like a chat bot or in click, because you might then want to have maybe the past three discussions and responses added to this list. When you're using it just in the CRM for generating text, you don't need to do that. Uh, then you create the parameters. Um, so what you do is you, and these are really the only two parameters which I'd recommend you, you always put on. You add in the model, you must give it the model. And I'm using GPT 3.5 Turbo. In this case, there are other models, but this is the one that we're using most of the time. And I would also recommend, it's not mandatory, but I would recommend that you also add the temperature and set to zero. Temperature is sort of like, how crazy do you want GPT to get? When you're up at about two, you're just getting gobbledygook. <laughs> but zero means absolutely dead pan, just the facts, man. So I normally set this um, just as a matter of course. So we've got a message list and we've got, the parameters list. Right. So, uh, oh, actually, there was one thing I just realized I didn't put in there. The parameters might have dropped off the screen. The parameters map, you also have to put in the messages list as well. So the message list becomes part of the parameters map. That should be there. Right. Now, you're going to call OpenAI. Put this inside a try, always. Um, I'm hoping everyone here is familiar with uh, the try function, but basically it's, it's a way of uh, saying, if this fails, do something else. And the reason why it's so important with OpenAI is um, certainly in the early days, it would time out. It would just not work. Sometimes it just would crash. Uh, they had outages. Um, I haven't had that happen much in about the last three months, but it's good coding practice. So what we do there is a simple invoke. Um, we open the AI URL that we set previously. So that's that standardized form. It's always gonna be a post. You send the parameters map, which again, I apologize. I should have had it on the previous slide, would include that messages, but really important. And this one took me ages to figure out. It took me a day, it was just it drove me crazy. You need to convert it to a string. If you just send it as a map, for whatever reason, it doesn't convert correctly, doesn't read correctly. But if you convert it to a, to a JSON string using the two string capability, no problem, just works. You send the headers, and um, I always like to, to make sure that it's sending detailed as being true. So that information is coming back. If it doesn't work, if whatever reason it times out, it's going to create a, a map and return the errors and a, a descriptive error. Strongly recommend that pattern here is what you always do anytime you call an external service from Deluge um, because things happen outside of the Zoho ecosystem. Right, uh, then you check the results. Um, again, here's the coding pattern for this. 
uh, you always make sure, even if the response comes back, you always make sure that you actually got a confirmation. In other words, a response code of 200. Uh, what you can then do is fetch. And again, this is a little bit tricky. You want to fetch the first response. It is possible to send OpenAI a request to generate multiple versions of the same thing based on the information you've given it. So we could generate, in this case, we could generate three different descriptions of the same tag. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it is possible. But anyway, once you've confirmed that you have a valid code response 200, you then need to filter through all of the, the response from OpenAI and get the content. And that's the code to use for that. So that's actually what you're going to get. Okay, and if there is an error on that, again, report the error. Finally, um, you transform your, transform your response. So now you have a bunch of text which has come from OpenAI. It is possible to tell OpenAI to give you an address formatted by town, uh, you know, street address, town, province, state, <laughs> country, etc. And it's amazing how little information can be expanded upon for that. You can ask it to turn it to JSON string and then you can split that string up. Um, for our marketing um, send, what we actually do is we've got a prompt that says, first of all, what we do is we open a Google document in behind the scenes and we read the Google document and then we say to OpenAI, give us the SEO uh, for that and a nice piece of text that will be SEO friendly to respond to that. Give us the email blurb that we're going to send out about this new piece of research. Give us two LinkedIn posts, one being conversational and the other one being academic. Give us a Twitter post. And uh, the other thing was recommend an image um, for this in text. And that's one call. And we can break that up by the way that we're turning the data. So that's a way of saving a lot of money. You don't want to do five API calls when you can do one. So um, you do be careful. Uh, OpenAI can be a little bit glitchy sometimes when you're calling those multi-stage cases. Um, but in general, you basically deconstruct or reconstruct whatever the return is. Uh, again, any questions on this? Because I do want this to be as open as possible. Uh, I think Kamal wants to see the slide number three. Sure, let's go back to slide number three. There we go. Yeah. So is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. So what we're having there, I'll just recap on this. This line here, I hope you can see my, uh, the GP, oops, go back. The GPT prompt equals, that is coming from the um, CRM organizational variable called GPT tag prompt. So it's a chunk of text. Within that text, we have square brackets and then a field name. And then for every one of the fields that we're wanting to replace with the actual text from the CRM, we simply do the prompt. Uh, that should be a lowercase g, I apologize. Uh, oh, no, that's correct. Um, no, it should be a lowercase. Uh, again, typos, I apologize here. Uh, GPT prompt, replace all, whatever it is the field that we want to replace with whatever field we've pulled from the CRM. So it's actually an incredibly simple pattern. Um, we've got the results, we've transferred the pattern, and then finally you write it, you write whatever the, you want back to the CRM, and it's just a state, you know, record update, off you go. Um, you've already got the tag ID, because that's what you passed to the system, you know the module, that's what you passed to it, and um, in this particular case, we are actually passing uh, the public definition of the tags, which we formulated in the, in the previous, um, we, we stripped out from the GPT response, as well as a set of questions, which we've also pulled out from the GPT response. And we upload that to our records. So that's it, nice and easy. Um, the, the final thing is that I just wanted to say that pretty much all of this, uh, I'd say 50% of the use cases could be handled by one API. I'm currently working on some code, which I'll show you whereby what you've got is a generic pattern. So 
we don't need to see that anymore. <laughs> Let's just keep going. Um, this pattern here basically says uh, you send it the module, a string of the ID, so whatever module you've got, could be a contact module or some custom module, uh, the ID of whatever record of the module you're going to be working with, the prompt that is going to be from that CRM um, uh, variable, uh, and then a string of basically fields, field names. And what you can then do is uh, pretty much the same pattern that we used before, but we, we first of all check to make sure that we've got all the right incoming information, and then we split that field list into the individual fields. Now, the, the beauty of Zoho and Deluge is that all the fields are declarative. You send them out as text. So if you send a list of text fields, what you can then do is call for the record ID, fetch the record, and then you can just have a loop to go through that list of field names that you've got, fetch every piece of data, get the prompt, and for every new field data that's in that record that you've just fetched, replace that field in that prompt. That's just what we've done. And now you've got, a, you've got an approach where you can have one API call that can handle of many, many options for your GPT calls. So that's a, that's a nice little thing which is coming up as well. Hope that all makes sense to you. Um, so look, um, I think we should uh, move to a pure questions and answer time. Um, but also, you know, what's next for this? Where are we heading with this type of technology? So I, I'm interested to hear what you folks are doing Okay, maybe a, a little demo. Maybe I'll actually show you a demonstration of what this looks like in, in real service. So I'm going to go to the IVRS tags environment. This is what I was telling you about before. It was literally the code that I was, I was working on. And I'm going to create a new tag. Just going to be a, a test. Now remember, our entire business runs off these ideas, these topics. Let's think of an interesting topic. Um, let's go open AI. Uh, better yet, let's go generative AI. So there's a new topic. Um, it is a uh, it's a tag. So we're going to use this on the website, for example. Um, now there's a whole bunch of other fields here that we could use. You know, what are other acronyms? How it is also known by, and so forth. But I won't bother about any of that. I'm just going to save it. So so far we have just this great piece of text. You know, generative AI. Well. If you were to now click on define this with GPT, so there's the description. It's going off to chat BTT, GPT, and it's using that pretty much that same code. Okay, so there's the description. Generative AI refers to a branch of artificial intelligence, yada, 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 yada. I'm just going to close that down, but let's actually see what's happened. It's added a public definition for this, which we could then go in and edit. So, wow, save us a heap of time. But this is what's absolutely magic. Here are the 10 questions that GPT understands are often asked about this topic. That's something we never thought, you know, that for a company like ours that, that does research, this saves hours and hours of time every single time. Do we necessarily trust this? No, that's why it goes into a private field like this. And then we make sure that our editors look over it. We make sure that our researchers fine tune it, but supercharged. So that's an example of the type of thing that you can do. Another example would be if I go to our publishing module. So this is where we publish all of our research and if you've got a piece of research here, actually, this might be this might be so easy to show, because basically what happens on this one is similar to what we said. We can create the social media automatically from it, and it will create a whole slew of social media. Again, we hand that to our marketing department to then finalize. So we think that's saving at least a day, if not two a month. So those are some of the real world use cases that we're using it for. Um, what are the risks? in exposing our internal data open AI. You are absolutely right. Up until about a month and a half ago, I would not have done this as much as aggressively. 
you notice I've not got any, that tag information is not what I would consider so company, company sensitive that I, I wouldn't mind if it leaked, but I certainly wouldn't be sending client data. About a month and a half ago, OpenAI confirmed that for their paid API accounts, they would not be using the training data. However, what I advise my clients on is you have to anticipate that OpenAI will be hacked because their security so far ain't so good compared to say Google's or Zoho's. So my advice is at this time, uh, you need to only pass information to this system that you wouldn't mind getting out of the public domain. Now, our research is not fully in the public domain. So there's actually parts of our research documents when I'm, when I'm reading those Google documents and extracting the information that we do not send to OpenAI. That's how sensitive we are, because uh, that's commercial and confidence. Um, but the tags and, and the abstracts of our documents and a whole range of other things, I don't mind. Basically, if I didn't want to accidentally lose it. <laughs> so it's a really important question. Those are the So the question that was, uh, can I show the organizational variables? You go to setup, Zoho CRM variables. Now there are unfortunately a limited number of these, please make them unlimited. Uh, but what I do is I've created a bunch of them called GPT dash something. So here's an example of the address formatter that we use. And so, and I'll open this up so you can see it fully. So what we do is we correct address from a record with no abbreviations, i.e. AU is Australia, UK is the United Kingdom. The address may be incomplete, so leave any unknown information blank and provide what is known. If the address has building levels included on that information is in the street field, etc. And then I've said I want it sent as uh, corrected as a JSON string of country equals country state equals country. That returns me a JSON script of a corrected address. So there's one example. Um, I'll show you another, uh, I'll show you the example, uh, another example of what we use for um, publishing advisory LinkedIn posts. There we go. This is, so write a conversational 100 word LinkedIn article about um, a aforementioned title and a bunch of hashtags. We actually expanded upon this one now. So this one's actually legacy, but that's an example. Um, the inquiry description rewrites. A lot of the inquiries we get from clients are poorly written. So what we do is we say, write a 150 word question for the following inquiry. The original inquiry text is this, etc. Here's the subject, here's our response, rewrite the inquiry into simple English, you know, <laughs> something that we can pass back to the client. So those are the sort of use cases that we're using. So I hope that helps. Amazing how you figure this out. Yeah, just trial and error <laughs> and lots of reading. Trial and error and lots of reading. Okay, look, are there any other questions? Ah, are those email inquiries coming through in the form of email? Oh, right. right, they come in from our chatbot, from API calls and other things we've got, from forms, Zoho forms and forms, uh, Gravity forms on our website. They come in from telephone calls. And when they do come in from email, we're not automating that. Um, that's the one thing that, that we don't do. All of this comes into the Zoho case management system that we've heavily customized for our purposes. But effectively, um, we, we have multiple ways of, that, of those inquiries coming in. We actually are planning to use ChatGPT uh, sorry, OpenAI rather than ChatGPT to create a mobile application where the user can speak to their phone when they're in a meeting and they're doing stuff about you know, planning their next ICT strategy. What we would like is them just to be able to speak into their phone, push a button and have that generate an inquiry for us. And then the next step would be us to take a look through the corpus of information that we've got, 20 years worth of information and say, here are three really good pieces of information you need to read. And by the way, we know based on what you've just asked that the expert in this field is Dr. Sweeney or Philip Nesky or whomever, you know, one of our staff, because 
again, those tags correlate to the expertise that we've got in the company. Would you like us to book you a call? Yes or no? They click yes, and it says, Phil Nesky's, um, Dr. Phil Nesky's availability next week is these five dates, choose one. That's where we want to get to. Uh, is there a reason why you're not doing it for emails as well? Um, the main reason is that I'm a little bit nervous of that because ripping apart email is, is actually quite difficult. And sometimes uh, what we've found is the information you've got headers and all sorts of stuff coming from it so you can get very very messy entries we could do it we've just decided at this time that it's maybe a little bit tricky if you can show me how to strip an email which often sometimes the emails come in and they'll say things like this we are upgrading from an e3 a microsoft e3 license to an e5 license because we're trying to get half of the value of purview uh, purview was a Microsoft product. By the way, if anyone's familiar with Microsoft, you'll know what I'm talking about there. Anyway, we want to know, is it better for us to A, stay with an E3 license and um, adopt a purview, uh, that subset of purview licensing, or is it better to go for the entire purview licensing? On top of this, we also need to understand the best practices for SharePoint information governance what does this do to our team's governance structure as well? Now, there's about four inquiries in that. <laughs> and there's actually different experts that need to be brought in onto that one question. So the challenge mm -hmm. with email is less a technical one and more just a messy complexity of how humans talk. Um, you've actually just prompted me. Maybe we can experiment with using, oh, no, I don't want to, I don't want to use GPT to send that information and, and, and pick it apart because there could be sense of information in that. So you get you get to see where my my dilemmas are. I, I was I was thinking like could you use ChatGPT to say parse out each individual inquiry in this email and then loop through each individual inquiry. Yeah, but, yeah. but but I wouldn't want to do that automatically. Um, I wonder if I could pop a button in the mail. So look, it's a really it's a really interesting idea. I am concerned that our clients sometimes send us, uh, I mean, one of the reasons um, why we aren't using Zoho's um, drive environment is we have to go multiple levels beyond that in terms of our clients' uh, document sensitivity. So a lot of the time these inquiries also send us documents. Um, and given that we deal with 50%, more than 50% of our clients are in the um, high compliance space, that that's just a, it's just a little bit tricky. <laughs> um, so we are super paranoid about what we send out to any third party service. What, I, what I is your concern with work drive security? Nope, we've got people leading. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay, can, can, there was one question. Um, look, go to www.ibrs.com. Um, you're not gonna get a lot, that's our official site, but, but I do hang out on the developer forums um in click um both the power forum and the regular forum that's probably the best place to get in touch with me i will uh probably copy the templated code um the full code that actually works and post that up on uh, uh the zoho forums probably the crm forum so that people can uh can take it and reuse it fantastic thank you everybody hi joe and hi. All Thank you for this wonderful presentation. We are so glad that you have tried uh, all the real-time use cases over here. Uh, I would ask you or suggest you to try our chat GPT integrations as well. So some of the- I have, I have. Yeah. right. Yeah, uh, still we are evolving and then we would like to know your feedback on what are the some of the use cases that you would love to see uh, in our uh, chat GPT integration with Zosia. Mm. I think one of the ones which I'd love to see, uh, which is you know something that Microsoft has been crowing about, is in the emails, um, uh, email templates with a prompt so that when the email template opens up, it goes and reads the various details, but better yet a prompt that can also feed off a function, okay. uh, a custom function, because that means that we could have email templates that you would open. This is not for bulk sendings, this is for one-on-one -on -one only. 
um, that would then automatically format the email based on what it knows about the client's progress in a opportunity, for example, or in progress in a um, an inquiry. That would be wonderful. A little bit tricky to, to implement, but that would be on my wish list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, regarding the security point of view, since the topic has come up, since we've taken the security as a primary concern, so that is why we are uh, building our native models to address the generative AI use cases. So if you see the record summaries or the enriching records based upon the external resources, or some of the emails on template use cases are something that is being worked on. So we'll be rolling out uh, in a couple of uh, months to see how we how we can solve the use cases internally without relying on any third party integration. So that is one thing we are working on. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be happy to hear from any comments like uh, from the others as well. What is the one use case that you will be really happy to have uh, solved from the AI, AI, AI assistant? So it will be easy for us whether our roadmaps are getting aligned with you guys or not. 